We stand at the edge of this new year. These 365 days in front of us. And instead of letting them blow by us, we look each of them in the eye. And one by one. We live them with intention. 365 days of sheer purpose. Each lived like it's the only day we've got. What if I live every day like no other day is owed to me? I'd reach out to my dad, make things right before it's too late. On my sister's birthday this year, I'd call instead of text. I would wake up in the morning and I would ask God what He wants me to do. I'd take those vacation days I still haven't used. Instead of inviting her to coffee, I'd invite her to church. Make myself get up early so I can watch cartoons with my kids. I'd give myself a break. I would take her to that park she's been wanting to go to, the one that's all the way across town. I'd say I love you, and I'd say it every day. On Thanksgiving, my table would be open to the whole neighborhood. Mother's Day would mean more than a $5 card. I'd let God have all the stuff weighing me down. I'd have more courage, because I'd have nothing to lose. I would take Jesus seriously when He asked us to feed the hungry. Serve the very least of these. Look after the sick. I'd be quicker to forgive because He forgave me. Living every moment with intention. Taking every purpose by the horns. Leaving nothing unsaid. Leaving nobody behind. Making every minute count. I would use every hour I had on this earth. To love God. To love others. One intentional day at a time. Good evening and welcome to Refuge tonight. Um, if you don't know who I am, although I think everyone in the room does, but my name is Nicole. Um, David stole my joke. I was going to say thank you for braving the Florida winter, but he already, already stole my joke, so I was nervous the whole time. But welcome. I am, I am so glad you are all here tonight. We, are, we keep working through our series that we're calling Refocus, Fixing our eyes on Jesus. If you missed anything from the last couple of weeks, I encourage you go back, watch, listen, where it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, it's on our website, it's even on a podcast. You can go and listen to it in your car. But a couple of weeks ago, uh, Brian set the stage for what this series would be. It's about intentional living. We talked. He talked about resolutions versus intentions, and to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we have to have him in the center of our life, which means intentional living. Brian said, intentions rooted in Christ are more powerful than any resolution. So our intentions with this series, you see what I did there? All right, it's going to be a long night if you guys don't laugh. So <laughs> it's going to be a real long night. But our intentions with this series is to take some of the most common resolutions that people make and uh, put a spiritual perspective on it while also bringing some practicality to the scriptures we read. Last week, David kicked us off with our resolutions about physical health and our physical bodies. Again, go listen to that message. It's a beautiful message. And like my biggest takeaway is that I'm never allowed to complain about back pain again. So I had a knot in my back all week, and I just kept thinking about those x-rays, and he was like, I'll just, I'll rub it out, it'll be fine, I just, but he talked about how we get so caught up in pant sizes, and numbers on the scale, and counting calories, that we forget in whose image we've been made, we forget that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that this body, that this vessel is built, Silverado strong. <laughs> If you don't get that joke, go listen to David's message and it'll be really funny. But this body was built to honor and worship the Lord. And so for me, that means seeing my value, seeing my purpose, seeing my identity in Christ, fixing my eyes on how fearfully and wonderfully God made me to be exactly as I am. And so Brian mentioned that when we started to talk this, we kind of had like a little bit of debate about which word is more powerful, resolutions or intentions. And for me, my, one of my arguments was resolutions are so often about us. We say, I'm not going to eat sugar. I'm not going to drink alcohol. I'm not going to eat carbs. And your year is going to suck. I'm just straight up with no carbs, like... But that we make it about us. And self-improvement is not a bad thing. I don't want you to walk out of this series and think, oh, the, pa the 
pastors don't want me to set resolutions. They don't want me to set goals for myself. That's the act, actually the opposite. Like I said, we're trying to give you some spiritual and some practical tools so you can reach your goals. Like for me, I don't set resolutions because I, I just don't follow through on them, but I make myself attainable goals. Like one year I decided that every time I go to the grocery store, I'm going to return my cart to the cart return. Some of you can borrow that. I know you might need to. But so that's a goal that I set for myself. But self-improvement is not a bad thing. We encourage it. And so for this year, 2024, the most popular resolution centered around physical health, which David talked about last week. And what I'm talking about tonight is mental health. Those are the two most popular things people made resolutions around. And 28% of Americans who made resolutions made them around mental health. And they set goals for themselves like exercising more, meditating, focus, or refocusing. <laughs> Long night it is. Focusing on spirituality, seeing a therapist, taking a break from social media, taking a break from uh, uh, screen time, journaling, reading more, seeing a psychiatrist. Um, in this article where I got this information from, they said 6% of people said they plan to try forest bathing. Exactly. And I looked it up. It's an activity involving uh, spending contemplative time in the forest environment, which that just sounds like going outside. But whatever you want to call it, to better your mental health, you, you live your best life. And so whether it's to improve, improve ourselves, reduce our stress, recover and heal from traumas, um, grow as a person, or just to be happy, many people will say hey, mental health is a priority for them. But are we living intentionally? Are we living like mental health is a priority? Are our eyes fixed on Jesus? And you're probably asking yourself, do Jesus and mental health even go together? Heck, yes, they do. And I'm going to teach you why tonight. But I love the phrase that we're using this series, living intentionally, because mental health is intentional. And, and the series is about making intentional choices that are rooted in Jesus, being mindful, being deliberate about our lives, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And when it comes to mental health care, you have to be intentional. We must live intentionally when it comes to mental health care. That doesn't mean that we have it all figured out. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we make all of the best decisions and everything we do or say is right. But it's about working to make those mindful, conscious decisions, bringing our daily life more in line with the values of Jesus. Intentions rooted in Christ are more powerful than any resolutions. So when we start to think about Jesus... I know most of our first thoughts isn't, man, he really had a lot to teach about mental health. Well, he didn't um, because mental health is more of a modern concept. Um, it's only been within like the last 15-ish years that people are like, hey, that might be important. So um, there's not a lot of teaching Jesus did on it. But even still, even though he didn't teach explicitly on it like I'm going to do tonight, Jesus was still very mentally healthy. And I know Jesus was mentally healthy. And I'll show you why I know that tonight. But just because Jesus was mentally healthy, hear this tonight, that just because Jesus was mentally healthy does not mean that he did not struggle with mental health issues. He was fully God and he was fully man. And he lived in a world that hated him, a world where religious leaders and Pharisees wanted him dead. He, he felt grief and loss from losing friends and family. He had crowds of people following him around all the time. He had to deal with the disciples. If you've ever discipled or mentored somebody, you know that they bring, they give you mental health issues all, all different. I know that I give Brian mental health issues on a regular basis. <laughs> it's Pentecostal. But I believe that um, if we think about it, but did Jesus have good and bad days. Did he have days where he didn't want to get out of bed? Did Jesus have days where he didn't want to pull back the blackout curtains? Did he have days where he felt anxious or so depressed that he had to skip meals because he just couldn't eat? Did he feel overwhelmed or burnt out? He was in ministry. So yes, he did. These things... any less perfect. These things did not make him any less God. And we can see how he practiced self-care. We can see how he was mentally healthy. And what was in his example and adapt his practices to all of fixing our, our eyes on him. We're going to start in John chapter 15, verse 4 through 5. And Jesus says, Abide in me, and I abide in you, just as a branch can Unless it abides in the vine, 
what does it actually mean to abide? When Jesus says abide in me, what does that mean? pressure is solitude in God's presence. He didn't bring scrolls to expand on his theology. He didn't bring the scriptures so he could interpret them and trying to figure out if people can have tattoos, if women could preach, if gay people can be Christians. He wasn't trying to answer these deep theological questions. He was simply trying to get into the presence of God so he could abide. And Jesus tells us how to do this in Matthew 6, verse 6. This is the message version. I really want you to hear this tonight. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. Then the focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. I want to read it again. Find a quiet and secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play. You won't be tempted to scroll on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Google, YouTube. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. I love that part so much because God isn't saying come with all of it figured out. Come knowing all the answers. He says, as simply and as honestly as you can manage. And as simply and honestly as we can manage sometimes is angry or anxious or depressed. 
And God wants us to come into his presence just the way we are, as simply and as honestly, honestly as we can manage. So then the focus shifts from our anxiety, from our depression, and from our fear, from our anger to God. And then we begin to feel his grace and his peace alone with God to abide. So whether it's in our room or on a retreat or in the wilderness, forest bathing, out on a boat in the middle of the ocean in your favorite recliner, on a beach chair by the ocean, on a run or a walk, Jesus knew that a key to good mental health is silently enjoying the presence of God alone. An introvert's dream. In Mark chapter 1, we see where Jesus is hardcore into ministry. He's rounded up his disciples. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing every sick person that's been brought to him. He's tired. He's weary. He's sleepy. He's surrounded. But in Mark 1, 35, it says, In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. While it was dark, he went where he could be alone, and he talked to God. There's a quote that I love, and it's up on the screen. It says, silence is God's first language. <clears throat> Everything else is a poor translation. And research has shown, so we're talking about Jesus, but let's fast forward here. We're in 2024. But research has shown that intentional and mindful-based practices like silence, solitude, even meditation are effective in reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I want to emphasize reducing because I'm not here selling you a fix-all. I'm not here to tell you Jesus is going to make it so that you're not depressed or you're not anxious or you can throw all of your, all of your drugs out the window. It is effective in reducing symptoms. Silent solitude and meditation can even improve your quality of life. And just as Jesus found solitude in a deserted place, modern research supports this idea. Mindfulness and meditation practice in solitude can lower stress, improve your focus, and better your overall emotional well-being. It's include things like journaling, solitary walks, silent prayer. They help us process our emotions. They help us process our thoughts. They give us a deeper self-awareness, an awareness of the image in which we've been made, an awareness of how intricately, intricately we've been designed, an awareness that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, created for abundant life, and that we get to experience that abundant life when we abide in Christ. Jesus lived out rest and disengagement. Jesus showed us it is okay to disengage from daily demands, right? Amen? It's okay to disengage, but the kicker is it must be intentional. Disengagement is not escape. This isn't a disengagement so you can escape into Netflix or The Crown or TikTok or Facebook Reels or play Candy Crush or Yahtzee. Again, I said I was preaching to myself, so all of those, <laughs> those are all my vices. I'm real, I'm real into Yahtzee right now. But disengagement is not about escape. It's about abiding. Jesus wasn't running from his disciples. He wasn't running from ministry. He wasn't running from the crowds. He wasn't running from stress. He was running to the presence of God, to deserted places, to solitude and silence, to abide in the presence of God. We all have means of escape, excessive use of social media, chronic binge watching, Substance abuse, compulsive shopping, overeating, overworking, procrastination, so much so that we've lost our ability to be present. We've lost our ability to be mindful. But Jesus knew that this practice, being mindful, being present, was key to good mental health, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So how can we put into practice the practices of Jesus? Paul helps us in Philippians 4, verses 6, 6 through 8. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. He says, don't worry about anything. 
instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Paul says, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Jesus encouraged trust and faith over anxiety and fear. Living intentionally means putting into practice trusting God over worry in our daily lives. But he doesn't, doesn't just say, okay, stop worrying, stop being anxious. Don't you love when people do that? When you, like, you feel worried or stressed or anxious, they're just like, well, don't worry. Oh, <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? You know what I mean? Like, just don't be anxious. Like, of all the things I could have done, just not being anxious, that's one of them. I, why didn't I think of that? But that's not what Paul is doing here. He actually gives us a way to reduce and improve our worry and our anxiety. It's abiding in God's presence, an intentional practice of prayer and solitude. He says, tell God what you need. Are you anxious? Tell God you're anxious. Are you angry? Tell God you're angry. Are you scared? Tell God you're scared. Tell him what you need in that moment, in his presence, and then begin to practice gratitude and thank him for what he's done. Thank him for what he's doing and thank him for what he's going to do. And when you do this, when you Trade, tr trade worry for trust, you tell God what you need, and you practice gratitude, you get to experience God's peace. And here's the thing about abiding in God. What did Jesus say? He said, abide in me as I abide in you. When we abide in him, he then abides in us, and we get to experience his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness. We get to experience the goodness of Jesus. And this peace guards our hearts and our minds. It guards our emotional and our mental well-being. God's abiding love and peace will center us. Silence, solitude, meditation, gratitude, they're all safeguards to our mental health. In Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trade their worry for trust in you and all whose thoughts and hearts and minds and eyes are fixed on you. A mind that is fixed on Jesus is a mind that can find peace. In 2018, I was turning 30 and I had a mini crisis. You know, when you're turning 30, you know, anyone who's ever been 29 knows that when 30 is right around the corner, you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm old. But my sermon notes are only 16 point font, so I think, I think I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> but I also am zoomed in on my iPad, so take that for what it's worth. But when I was about to turn 30, I set a goal for myself. I set an intention that while I'm 30, I'm going to do an Ironman triathlon. Now, I don't know when I've told this story, but I'm certain that I have because, one, I like to talk about myself, and, two, when you do an Ironman, you brag about doing an Ironman, okay? <laughs> Mike knows. Mike knows. But um, if you don't know what an Ironman or a triathlon is, a triathlon is a race where you swim, bike, run, one after the other, all in one day, all in one race. An Ironman is the longest race that there is, and it is a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile uh, bike ride, 26.2-mile ride, back to back to back, all in one day. And my message is that you need to do an Ironman. The Lord, for your physical health to be aligned, just, I'm just kidding. It's hard. They're hard. And so I spent 11 months, 300 training sessions, 2,200 miles on my bike, 640 miles running, 800 or 87 miles swimming in the pool to prepare for this race. 
countless hours. I sacrificed sleep. I sacrificed social events and time with friends and family so that I could train for this race, so I could spend a nine, ten-hour day on my bike getting myself ready for this race. My eyes were on the prize, which is just finishing, BT dubs. <laughs> just want to finish, not trying to win this stuff. But this race, it took me 16 hours to cross the finish line. And so I brag a lot about doing an Ironman. I'm very careful with my language to not say that I completed an Ironman. While I did the whole course, and I did cross the finish line in the dark evening hours after 14 hours of very intense raining, I was tired. I was hurting, and I was ready to be done, and I took my eyes off of the course. My mind started to focus on finishing and bragging rights. I started to think about just being done and taking a hot shower and sleeping in a warm bed. It was in Northern California, so the water I swam in was 55 degrees, and then the air that I got out into was 60 degrees. It took me 17 minutes to get from the water to the bike, and I know you don't know what that means, but it's supposed to take you like 90 seconds to transition from each race. It took me 17 minutes because I'm from Florida. I don't do cold. But my eyes were not fixed on the course, and I missed a timing mat. I missed a checkpoint so that they can track my time and my distance and my pace. I took my eyes off just the course, distracted by a million other things and I missed this just subtle left turn a quarter mile that way over the mat a quarter mile back over the mat and because I missed this checkpoint I was disqualified from this race 11 months six days a week countless hours countless miles all for a big fat DQ (laughs) You can still look up times from previous races. If you look it up, it says DNF, did not finish. My mom was going to sue Iron Man. Like, we were on the phone. Like, we were, you think I'm kidding? No, my mom was like, I have attorneys. I have attorneys on retainer. And it just turns out that I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So what? Who cares, right? I'm not doing an Iron Man, so what does this have to do with me, Nicole? And so you probably sat here and heard me give this really good old churchy message that Jesus is all you need. Stop worrying because of Jesus. Don't stress because of Jesus. Don't be sad because of Jesus. You don't have to have mental health issues because of Jesus. And yeah, you could probably walk out of here tonight and that could be the message that you hear. I can't change that. But I saved this to the end because it's important because everything that I mentioned tonight practices a solitude and silence, gratitude, quiet meditations, Praying in deserted places, being alone, abiding in prayer, abiding in God's love, and abiding relationship. These are all supplemental things to very practical and very intentional living. Therapy is intentional living. And I might be biased because I'm on course, on track to be a therapist, but I don't think that there's a better tool for personal and spiritual development than therapy. All the practices we talked about go hand in hand with therapy. Taking medication is living intentionally under under supervision of a qualified doctor. (laughs) Don't go out and buy Adderall because Nicole said medication is living intentionally. No. (laughs) If it's prescribed to you, it has your name on it, and there is a doctor taking care of you, please take your medication. It is an act of worship to care for our physical bodies. I believe that our bodies can be chemically imbalanced, and I believe that medication helps that balance. I believe doctors and medications are gifts from God to help us navigate these things because meditation is not enough when you're manic depressive. Manic uh, me- uh, Meditation is not enough when you have anxiety through the roof. Medication is not enough when you have bipolar or uh, borderline personality disorder. We have to live intentional with these practical things. Reading a book, reading scripture, these are intentional And it takes intentions to study the ways of Jesus. So read a self-help book. 
They work. If you don't know what to read, send me a text message. I got lots of stuff you can read. We can learn practical ways in, uh, to manage anxiety, improve our self-esteem, cope with stress. There's a ton of stuff out there. Silence is intentional. It takes an intentional effort to remove yourself from distractions, to disengage, and to be quiet. It is so hard to be quiet. I have a four-year-old. Silence eludes me. <laughs> but it, it takes intentional work to actually sit down and be silent. It takes practice. Setting boundaries is intentional. Mindfulness is intentional. Journaling is intentional. Gratitude is intentional. And Jesus lived all of these things and taught us these things through his life. So living intentional means abiding in God's presence. Sit with God. Living intentional means practicing silence and solitude. It, it is intentional to disengage and find a place of silence and solitude. Rest and disengagement. Stop. Turn off the phone, the TV, the computer. Delete the apps if you have to. Eliminate as many distractions as possible and disengage so you can meditate and quiet your mind and you can be present and be grateful with God and tell him what you need. Don't be me. <laughs> Don't get disqualified. Don't get distracted and miss your goal. Don't be the person who walks out of here tonight and said, Nicole had some really good things to say, dot, dot, dot. Be the person who walks out of here and is intentional Paul wraps up his encouragement in Philippians 4, verse 9, and I'm going to ask the band to come as we close out here. In Philippians 4, verse 9, Paul says this, Keep putting into practice. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me, then the God of peace will be with you. Keep putting into practice. Keep being intentional. Keep practicing. Keep abiding. Don't leave here tonight. Just resolve to do things differently. Leave here tonight keeping your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. I'm going to ask you to stand as we move into a time of worship, and I'm going to read Philippians 4, 8 again for you from the message. It says, you will do best by intentionally filling your minds, intentionally filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly things to praise. So will you be intentional tonight and set intentions on abiding in the presence of God, being with God, telling God what you need and practicing gratitude. Would you worship with us tonight?